Well, I'm so excited to share God's word with you tonight. We're going to we're going to get started. So, we are teaching on the horsemen of the apocalypse. And if you're with me, please turn with me to Daniel chapter 2 verse 22. I'd like to open with this verse tonight. He revealeth the deep and secret things. He knoweth what is in darkness, and the light dwelleth with him. One thing I want to share with you, saints of God, is when we when we study the deep things of the Spirit, and we study the deep things of, of biblical prophecy, we are entering into a deep place, and sometimes and often a dark place. And we need the light of Christ. We need the light to bring revelation. We need the light to bring illumination. And even as you read the prophecies of Zechariah and Daniel, often it was in the night time that these prophecies were given. And there were often times where the prophets would enter into times of fasting and prayer and seeking God for interpretation. And I'm telling you, what we are diving into are, are the deep things of the Spirit. Um, from all my studies so far, I, I have found the book of Revelation to be one of the most intriguing books in the entire Bible, probably the most difficult book in the entire Bible to understand. And I've come to the conclusion that we will not understand the fullness of Revelation until all these events have come to pass. And I really believe that God's going to raise up Jewish scholars, the Jews, that are going to that are going to bring light to the to, to the scriptures of Revelation, because there are so many hidden mysteries in the Book of Revelation, and and these depth the depths of these words will not come in, into our understanding without without having a deep understanding of God's holy Torah, the Torah being the first five books of the Bible: Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, because the Book of Revelation is so filled. With, with with hidden mysteries and we're, we're gonna we're gonna dive into these mysteries tonight and next week and the upcoming weeks it's my goal to conclude conclude this teaching series of the book of revelation by around the time of rosh hashanah or even into the feast of tabernacles so again to, the title for tonight's teaching is the end of days the horsemen of the apocalypse and the date of this teaching is on monday august 31st so folks thank you so much for joining me tonight and i'm telling you one of the signs of these end day of the end of days one of the signs of the end of days is the mystery of the horsemen of the apocalypse and tonight i'll, I'll mainly be using the scriptures from zechariah and revelation to bring this teaching to you tonight uh, Revel let's look at zechariah chapter 1 verse 8 Zechariah 1 8 reads, I saw in the night, and behold, a man riding upon a horse. He was standing among the myrtle trees in the glen, and behind him were red, sorrel, and white horses. So we see we, we see a man and we see horses. Now let's turn to the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter six, and I'm going to read verse two, verse four, verse five, and verse eight. You'll notice here one of the methods I'm using to interpret scripture is by using comparison. So I'm, I'm using various texts in scripture that have similar words, and, we'll, and I'm going to use those words, I'm going to use those similarities to bring an interpretation to God's word. Because we always want to take scripture within context, and we also want to use intertextuality when we study God's word, and especially when we interpret God's word. So again, uh, Revelation uh, chapter 6, verse 2. And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and its rider had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he went out conquering and to conquer. So we see, we, we see, we, we see a white horse with a rider with a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he went out conquering. And then in verse 4, we read about another horse, and it says, And out came another horse bright red, its rider was permitted to take peace from the earth so that men could slay one another and he was given a great sword so we see the first the white horse with its rider with a bow then we see the second horse being a red horse and it and its rider having a great sword and then in verse 5 it reads when he opened the third seal i heard the third living creature say come and I saw and behold a black horse. And now we see a white horse, a red horse, and a black horse. And its rider had a balance in his hand. Then let's go to verse 8 where we see a fourth horse. And I saw and behold 
a pale horse, and its rider's name was Death, and Hades followed him. And they were given power over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword and with famine and with pestilence and by wild beast of the earth. Taken from Revelation 6, verses 2, 4, 5, and 8. Now, as we're reading these texts, especially in the book of Revelation, we're reading mysteries and we're reading, we're reading, reading things that are very prophetic. That, and every word that we've read, the colors, the, the horses, the riders, every, everything that's being spoken about is, is in a prophetic sense. And so I'm, one thing I do understand about the horses is these horsemen are angels that are sent out to carry out instructions from, 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 from God. And the person that opens these seals, because these seals, as we see in verse 5, the third seal being opened, the one that opens the seals is Christ Jesus, the Messiah. And Christ Jesus, is the, the Messiah, is depicted as a lamb because Christ Jesus is the lamb who was slain before the creation of the world. The lamb, as we see in, in the book of Exodus, the, the blood of the lamb was struck upon the doorpost of every Jewish home, representing Christ Jesus whose blood was struck upon the cross. The doorpost in Exodus parallel the cross that we see in the Gospels. And these horses that we see are, 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 are angelic, and the riders are angelic, and they're carrying out instructions from the Almighty. And if you recall from a teaching I gave a few weeks ago where I talked about the four horns, the four horns represent the four kingdoms, the four empires that ruled over the Jewish people. In, in, in this description, I'm not going to count the Egyptian exile. The exiles I'm going to count are the exiles the way de they are described by the prophet Daniel. The first exile being the Babylonian exile, the sec or the first horn. The second horn being the Medes and Persians. The third horn representing the Greek empire, which began with, under the leadership of Alexand Alexander the Great who conquered the Holy Land. And the fourth empire is the Roman Empire, that, representing the fourth horn, the fourth exile of the Jewish people. So these four exiles uh, are the exiles experienced by the Jewish people according to the narrative of, of, of Daniel. The fourth exile will come to an end by Christ Jesus the Messiah. Now next week, it's my goal to take you into the war of Gog and Magog. And the final war of Gog and Magog will be, will be brought to a conclusion uh, with the coming of Christ Jesus the Messiah. So we'll talk about that next Monday night. But tonight, I want to I talk to you about the four horns and also talk to you about the four horses and, and, and the horsemen. Now, the horns are empires that, 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 were, that rose up that brought the Jewish people under subjugation. These horsemen, the horses that we see, I believe have been raised up. They're, in jail, they're sent by God and they're being used by heaven to bring an end to, to the four empires that, that, that have brought havoc and destruction to the Jewish people. So I don't want you to see these horsemen in a negative sense. I want you to see them in a positive sense. And, the, and they're, they're, they're being sent out to carry instructions from heaven. Amen. Now, I don't understand every single symbol that we're going to read about, but the, but the symbols that I have an opinion on, I, I, I will elaborate upon. And those that I don't have an opinion, a, 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 an opinion on, I will not discuss. And I'm telling you, we will not understand the fullness of these scriptures until after they come to pass. That's one of the beauties of biblical prophecy. You know, it, We'll have so many scholarly debates and discussions and, and various opinions about what's taking place in end times. But you know, we really will not know what they all mean in, 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 in their fullness until the events come to pass. For example, Queen Esther prophesied the hanging of 10 Nazi leaders in the Nuremberg Trials. And, the, and there are very specific scriptures in the book of Esther that prophesy their destruction. But the, but the prophecy was not understood into, until after the events came to pass. And I believe the same is true for our understanding of the book of Revelation and even end time events in Zechariah and Daniel and other scriptures as, as well. We will not understand the fullness until after the, the events come to pass. Another difficulty and another challenge 
in in understanding biblical prophecy is prophecy is not something that's fulfilled only one time in uh, if it's in the word of god then it's usually there because those scriptures will be fulfilled over and over and over again for example we always read about the end time war of gog and magog and we always wonder there have been so many Christ christian scholars that have talked about that war and 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 there's so many different opinions about what that war is and and there's so much confusion and i believe one area of confusion is is a misunderstanding in what prophecy is because prophecy as i said earlier will fulfill itself at multiple times in throughout history and there isn't just one war of gog and magog there are multiple wars of gog and magog and when you understand prophecy within that context within within that framework then then, it'll, then the scriptures will not be so confusing to you and again we're not going to know the fullness until the events have already come to pass amen so i want you to see the horses the horsemen uh, in, in 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 a in, in a prophetic sense, I want you to see the horses and the horsemen as being angelic beings, and the the the, the man in Zechariah chapter one verse eight, we see a man riding upon a red horse. Now tonight, I'm not going to get caught up in the colors of the horses and what the colors mean. I know there's prophetic meaning to the colors, but um, this is something that I'm still I'm still studying, and I haven't gotten to, I haven't come to an I have not come to an opinion yet that that, that that really satisfies my curiosity. So uh, God willing, in the future, we will come into the colors because I know everything in the Bible is significant. It has prop prophetic implications, but right now I don't know what these colors mean. Amen? So we'll, we'll come back to that. But I do want you to see a man riding upon a horse and he was standing among the myrtle trees in the glen. Now, again, th these horsemen are angels, and they are sent out to carry out tasks set by the Almighty. And your mission tonight is to join me as we dive into this study. And I pray the Holy Spirit will bring us all revelation this evening, that we're all going to grow leaps and bounds in, in God. And I pray that everyone that's watching tonight, Father God, that you, that everyone's going to become more prophetic, that you, you're going to speak to your people in night visions and dreams, and that you are going to reveal the mysteries of end times to your people tonight. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. So we're going to come back. Let's come back to Zechariah. Zechariah 1 8. There was an angel sitting on the white horse, as we see in Zechariah 1 8, a man riding upon a red horse. The man that Zechariah saw was actually an angel. And the rabbis tell us, at least according to one rabbinic opinion, the man that rode upon that red horse, that first red horse, was the angel Gabriel. And we often see Gabriel, the angel Gabriel, in events that relate to the Messiah. Because we see Gabriel and Michael, um, uh, uh, it's, I believe they're both, they, both of these archangels are assigned to Israel. And every, every angel has a different mission. It, we, we see the archangel Gabriel, who, who appeared to Mary, the, the virgin, to tell her that she was to become the mother of God. And she, be, and she conceived Christ Jesus, the Messiah, in her womb without knowing a man. We, we, and, we, and we see the archangel Mike, Michael fighting Satan. In the book of Jude, we see Michael, the archangel, fighting Satan for the body of Moses. So, so we, see, we see Michael involved in the wars of Israel. But both angels are very much involved in end time events. So it's not a surprise that Gabriel is, is, is mentioned here. If you turn to Daniel chapter 9, verse 21, it says, While I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the first, came to me in a swift flight at the time of the evening sacrifice. See, G Daniel had been in prayer. And, at the, and, and it's prayer that releases angelic activity. And as, as he had been in prayer, in intercession, in fasting, in supplication, God sent an angel to Gabriel to explain the visions to him. So, and, and Gabriel is describing end time events to Daniel. And in, going back to Zechariah chapter 1, it says that this angel, or Gabriel, was standing among the myrtles of Babylonia. He, was descri he, de he describes 
a man among the myrtle trees in the glen. And the interpretation of that is, this angel, Gabriel, was standing in the myrtles of Babylonia. The red horse indicates that God will exact retribution upon all the nations that have subjugated the Jewish people. Remember the four horns that I spoke about? And, and how the four horns um, inflicted unjust infl uh, 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 trouble upon the Jewish people? Well, these horses have come to exact retribution from the nations or the horns that have subjugated and, and treated the Jewish people in a cruel manner. And these four nations, these, these four horns are the Babylonians, also called Chaldeans, Medes and Persians, which represent the second horn, and also, also represents the, the, um, the third kingdom, the Greek, and the fourth kingdom, the Romans. So these horses, with their respective horsemen, have been sent from heaven to exact retribution from the four horns. Does that make sense? And the prophetic teaching I want to give to you, something that you can apply to your lives at this very moment, is you are, you are not just living upon this earth, living a physical earthly existence. You are also living in the spirit, and, 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 there, and every one of us is in a spiritual battle. Sometimes the devil will come to, to inflict attacks upon your family, upon your finances, upon your loved ones. Sometimes you're inflicted with sickness that, that comes from the pit of hell. Sometimes you come, you come upon all these horrifying demonic attacks that affect you and or your loved ones. And sometimes these attacks are spiritual attacks. And we must learn how to engage in spiritual warfare. Because, you know, really, we, we live in two different realms. We live in the natural, in the physical world, but we also live in the spirit as well. And sometimes things that affect us in the physical may be upon you because of spiritual reasons. For example, there may be someone that is inflicted with a sickness. And, and you've, gone to every, you've gone to so many different doctors for, for, to resolve that sickness and that illness, and no doctor can, can really diagnose why, you're, why you are experiencing those symptoms. And sometimes it's because of a spiritual condition. It could be a spiritual cause to, to that infliction. Sometimes it could be because of a demonic word curse. And these things must be broken because we are not only waging war in the physical, we are also waging war in the realm of the spirit. And that's something I want you to understand is that we're, that, 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 that we're living in two places. We live in the earth realm and we also live in the spiritual realm. Amen. And if you don't believe me, just look, look, look throughout Scripture. Look at, through the book of Revelation. There is so much heavenly spiritual activity that, 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 that's taken place. And I want all of you to become, to allow the Spirit of God to open your eyes and to open your eyes to the realm of the Spirit and to let you know that, that there are angels assigned to you. That, I mean, there is so much angelic activity. And, and it's our prayers, it's our supplications to God alone. And often when I pray, I ask the Lord Jesus, please release angels on my behalf to handle, to, to help me in this situation. And, and, to, and, and to really, to, to really to know who we are and to know how we can incorporate the Spirit, the, 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 the Spirit of God to help us in our spiritual battles. Amen? And angels... And, and when an angel comes, as you see here in, in Daniel and in Zechariah chapter 1, an angel, we see an angel not performing task alone, but we see an angel followed by other angels as well. For those of you that were with me when we studied the life of Jacob, when Jacob was departing and fleeing from his brother Esau, and he was, he was going into Syria to his uncle's house, the house of Laban, and he came to a certain place and lay down to sleep. And what took place, he had a vision of, of a ladder that connected earth to heaven. And he saw angels ascending and descending in, in, in his prophetic dream. And the interpretation of that dream is, when, he, when he, was leave, he was just about to exit the borders of Israel, and the angels that accompanied him to that point had finished their mission, so these angels ascended to heaven. And then at the same time, Jacob sees an additional camp of angels coming down that ladder, and these were angels that were sent from God to accompany Jacob into the next phase of his, of his destiny, and that was to go into exile. That was to go into Laban's house. And then years later, when he returns back to Israel, a camp of men join him. This camp of men that joined him were 
probably the original camp of angels that were accompanying him to the promised land. And I want what I want you to know is wherever you are in life and wherever you are in destiny, for whatever mission God will send you upon, he will not send you alone, but he will send a camp of angels to accompany you. Because what, what, cause every one of us is on an assignment from heaven. And God will not leave us comfortless. He will send, he gives us the Holy Spirit who's our comforter. We, 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 have, we have authority through the blood of Jesus and through the word of our testimony. And in addition, God has sent angels who are ministering spirits that are sent to those that are to inherit salvation, as we see in the book of Hebrews. So I want you to know there's an angelic activity all around you. And I, and I encourage you at all times to invite, to ask Jesus to send angels on your behalf, to send angels to help you in your ministry, to send angels to do spiritual warfare. Because I want you to know that we, we are also living in the realm of the Spirit. And so we see here in Zechariah that angels are sent because each, each angel has a, a task that's given him by the Almighty. Now I'm going to use one of the rabbis that I've been studying for this text, a rabbi that's known as Radak. You've heard me talk about Rashi, Rambam, Ramban. Tonight I'm going to use the the the, um, the, the Radak. And the Radak says that the visions that were seen by Zechariah and the four and the and the four horses parallel the vision that Daniel had in Daniel chapter seven, because Daniel describes the four kingdoms or the four horns that would rule over Israel. And let's look let's go back to Daniel. We, I think we've used this text before, but we'll use it tonight as well. Daniel chapter 7 verses 3 through 7. And it reads, "And four great beasts came upon uh, uh, came up out of the sea, different from one another. These four these four great beasts are also the four horns described. There are four kingdoms that will rule over Israel." or have ruled over Israel. The first one was like a lion and had eagle's wing, wings. And then as I looked, its wings were plucked off and it was lifted up from the ground and made to stand upon two feet like a man. And the mind of a man was given to it. This represents Nebuchadnezzar, who was the, who was the king of the Babylonians. And Nebuchadnezzar led the southern kingdom of Israel, Judah and Benjamin, into captivity. So he, he's described as a head of gold in, 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 in his dream. He's also described as an eagle in, in, this, in this prophecy here. Then verse 5 says, And behold another beast, a second one like a bear. It was raised up on one side. It had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth, and it was told, Arise, devour much flesh. See, this is very, very descriptive, but this is not to be taken literally. These, these are figure, these are figurative, and we need to, we need to interpret it the way the Lord has given it to Daniel. This bear represents two kingdoms that rule together: the Medes and the Persians. The Medes and Persians actually took turns ruling over the empire. The Medes and the Persians. So it starts with the Medes and the Persians, and the Medes and the Persians. So this is this is the bear. And then, as we look at verse 6, after this, I looked and behold, and lo, another like a leopard, with four wings of a bird on its back. And the beast had four heads, and dominion was given to it. This represents the empire of the Greeks. It, be, it was led by the leopard, representing the, the, the Greek Empire, the Grecian Empire, led by Alexander the Great. But after Alexander the Great died, his four generals took over the empire. And these are the four heads, because his empire was divided into four. And then in verse 7, it says, After this, I saw in the night visions. See, that when it says night visions, it's not just speaking about a literal night, even though it is night. It's also speaking about these are very dark uh um, dark in the terms of very mysterious. They're, they're secret. They're, 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 these, are, these are prophecies that are very difficult to understand. And so in verse 7 it says, And behold, a fourth beast. And look at how he's described. Look at how this fourth beast or fourth horn is described. 
a fourth beast, terrible and dreadful, and exceedingly strong, and it had great iron teeth. It devoured and broke in pieces and stamped the residue with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that, that were before it, and it had ten horns. See, this is the most dreadful beast of them all. And even Daniel had difficulty defi- you know, describing this beast. And this fourth beast, which came into came into play after the life of Daniel, is the Roman Empire. And then from it, we see ten horns, ten kingdoms. And from one of the ten horns, we see eleventh horn, a, a, a little horn that spoke blasphemies. And we spoke about that horn about two two to three weeks ago. Now, just to just just to summarize, the red horn represents the red horse represents Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. Because he saw himself as he saw himself, he was described as the head of gold, and red looks similar to to gold. And this horn brought brought destruction in the, in the earth, and you can see if you if you study in Jeremiah and you see the destruction that that Babylon brought to the Jewish people, especially the southern kingdoms and the exile. The the the, and the 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 brutality that the that Nebuchadnezzar inflicted upon the Jewish people, and so we see these four horns or these four beasts bringing destruction to the Jewish people. But what what does God do? It's connected mida connect mida connected mida measure for measure, and God comes and sends these 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 four horses to 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 bring retribution for the Jewish people. Now, going back to Zechariah chapter 1, verse 8, which, I, which is really the, the key text for, for tonight's teaching, it says, I saw in the night, and behold, a man riding upon a red horse. He was standing among the myrtle trees in the glen. Now, he was standing in the glen. Let's, let's talk about that for a moment. The myrtle represents the nation of Israel. The myrtle trees, and the myr- the myrtles have a very pleasant scent. Can you say pleasant scent? There was a pleasant odor. The pleasant scent represents the beautiful scent that come when the Jewish people observe God's commandments. And these prophecies that we're talking about here are prophecies that apply to the Jewish people. See, when you read Revelation, and not just Revelation, when you read the entire Bible, you, you need to be, learn how to divide which prophecies apply to the Jews and which prophecies apply to the Gentiles and which prophecies apply to everybody. We need to learn how to, we need to, learn how to divide the word of truth. In the book of Revelation, the first, the first few chapters really seem to be addressing the church, the, 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 the non-Jewish believers. And then later on, the, 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 the binoculars switch from, the, from the, the church, the Gentile believers, and switches to the, to the Jews. And so we need to understand what, who, to whom the prophecies are being addressed to. That's another, that's another thing that we need to overlay when we interpret God's word. Another thing that we need to add on are the biblical feasts, because you cannot understand the book of Revelation or anything about end time events unless you un- understand God's timetable. When you understand the, the the heavenly cycles, you know we're all we're all familiar with with the earthly cycles of, of the seasons. We're all, but but how many of us are familiar with with, with the heavenly seasons? Next week, we'll, uh, or the week after, we're going to talk about the heavenly seasons. Now, the myrtle trees represent. The nation of Israel and the sweet scent that comes forth comes forth from the myrtle trees represent how pleasing the Israel the, the how pleasing Israel is to God when they perform God's commandments. And for those of you that have studied with me for some time, you'll know that the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, consist of six hundred and thirteen commandments. Those six hundred and thirteen commandments apply to the Jewish people. We as non Jew as non Jewish believers are not under six hundred and thirteen commandments. We are under seven commandments known as the seven Noahid laws. In contrast, the Jewish people are under six hundred and thirteen commandments. Some of those commandments only apply to men, some of those commandments only apply to women, some of those commandments only apply to priests, but those six hundred and thirteen commandments are designated to the Jewish people. 
And when the Jewish people perform God's commandments, it's like a sweet scent that comes forth from a myrtle tree. And the angel that's standing there, and that angel is standing on the ground, he's standing in Babylon. And he's standing there to assist them and redeem them out of exile. See, these angels are on heavenly assignment. They are sent by God to bring forth the redemption of the Jewish people and to redeem them from their exile. And the horse, the the horse with the rider, because in Zechariah one eight, we in 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 Zechariah's vision, he only sees one rider, and then he sees followed by the first horse. We see three additional horses with no rider. In in John's prophecy, in Revelation, he describes four horses, each horse having its own rider. And one thing I've been pondering is we, we see four horses in Zechariah's vision, the fourth horse being white in color. And then when we go into the, the, the Revelation, in the book of Revelation, where we see John's vision, we see the first horse is white in color. So one thing I was pondering, is there a connection between the white horse in the prophecy of Zechariah being the fourth horse, and the horse that John, the first horse in John's vision, which is white in color, is there is there a relationship? I think there is, but I don't have enough. I don't have enough background to give you a definitive answer. Because I'm I'm wondering if, if if there is a connection, but I don't know yet. And that's one of the beauties. Uh, one of the beautiful things about studying biblical prophecy is you often end up with more questions than answers. And you know what? If I don't have questions after my study, I really wonder if I've really studied God's Word properly. Because uh, when, when you study God's Word, you go from glory to glory to glory. And I never get to a place where I'm fully satisfied with, with, with all of my studies. Because if I've had a good study, I will often end up with more questions than answers. Of course, I'll have more revelation. I'll have more confidence in the text I'm going to teach. But in addition, I'm going to have more questions. If you were to see all my notes as I'm preparing, you, you will see that I'll, I'll have so many questions. And by the time I'm done with my study for, for, for the week's teaching, I'll have more questions than answers. And and I, I just write them down. I ponder them. And sometimes a revelation will come to me in a dream. Sometimes a revelation will come to me in the future. Sometimes a re revelation will come within hours, within weeks, within months, within years. And sometimes I just I, I, I just wait. Because God doesn't give me all the answers when I'm looking for the answers. I wait upon God to reveal His mysteries to me. See, I can't force the book of Revelation to come into clarity. I, ha I, I completely depend upon God to bring the revelation. Sometimes a revelation w w will come in my studies. Sometimes a revelation will come through rabbinic commentaries. And sometimes I don't get the revelation right away. I just I have to wait upon God. And I encourage all of you to really dive into God's Word. You know, so many of us have gotten got, have, have gotten so into reading our, the Word upon electronic devices, and I, I do that as well. But that shouldn't be the only way that we study God's Word. You know, if you were, if you were to see my desk at home, you, you, you'll 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 see I'll, I'll I'll have a hard copy of, of the Bible, and I'll, and often I'll, I'll use a couple of rabbinic commentaries in, in, in my studies, and I'll use online sources as well. But I'm telling you, the study of God's Word is so exciting to me. It's more exciting than anything else I do in life, and I'm telling you. And sometimes I spend hours and hours and hours digging into God's word for answers and time and prayer, asking the Holy Spirit to reveal His word to me. Because I'm telling you, saints of God, I don't have I don't have the answers. I I must depend upon the Holy Spirit to to bring clarity. You know, sometimes m my understanding of scriptures has been clouded because of because of even teaching that I've listened to over the over the years. And sometimes I have to unlearn what I've learned in order to allow the Holy Spirit to teach me what He wants to teach me. And and I and I believe it's more difficult to unlearn than it is to learn. And if you if you've experienced that, please let me know. Because it because sometimes the biggest block in learning God's word is is myself. And I need to learn how to empty myself and allow the Spirit of God to reveal His Word to me. Right now in my studies, just to let you know where I am right now, I, 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 am, I am in the book of Revelation just about, every, just about every day. And I'm asking the Lord just to teach me the secrets of the book. I know I'm not going to understand the fullness of the book because I don't believe I'm going to get that full revelation until after all the events have come to pass. 
But my prayer is that God's going to reveal more and more of His Word to us. Because I believe God wants to teach all of us the depths of His Holy Word. And I'm, and I'm telling you, this is a very, a very exciting time. And the closer and closer and closer that we get to the rapture, to the, t- to the moment that we are, c- we are caught up in the sky in the, twinkling of an eye, in the twinkling of an eye to meet our Lord and Savior in the sky, we're gonna get we're gonna get so much more revelation of the of the book of Revelation, and so I, as we as we study God's word, I I want you to also know to whom God is speaking. See, there 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 are many things that will take place that will bring about about the completion of the creation, and we can understand that in the way that God established Israel. The Jews were given a, a three different commandments upon possessing the land of Israel. So the commandments were when they possessed the land of Israel, which they did under the leadership of Joshua. Joshua was Moses' Moses' successor. The three instructions that were given upon possessing the land were was number one, to appoint a king. And they did that when, when Saul was appointed the first king of Israel. So that was number one. The second, uh, the second task they were to perform was to annihilate, eliminate Amalek. And Saul failed in, failed in that commandment because he let King Agag live. So that, that's the second commandment. And the third commandment was to build the temple. And that was fulfilled through Solomon. King Solomon, the, the, son, the son of David, the third king over Israel. So, so these were three requisites for the Jewish people upon possessing the land of Israel. Now, in the book of Revelation, the land is not just the land of Israel, it's the entire earth. And, and we see those same three requisites in the book of Revelation. Number one, to appoint a king. Well, get, guess what? When you look at Revelation chapter 1, verse 1, the, the book, that we, set, we, see the, we see the theme being described in verse 1, the revelation of Jesus Christ. Because who is being revealed in the book of Revelation? Christ Jesus the King is being revealed. And we see the entire world becoming part of the kingdom of Christ Jesus. So what, what do we see in Revelation? We see the appointment of a king. That's Christ Jesus. The second requisite is to annihilate Amalek. Amalek is a is an antichrist. So what do we see? We see Amalek. We we see antichrist being defeated in the book of Revelation. That's the second requisite. The third requisite is to build a temple. Well, go to the end of Revelation. And what do we see? We see the third. We see the city of Jerusalem, and the entire city was a temple. We see Jerusalem, the new Jerusalem, coming down from heaven. So we see this th- these same three requisites being fulfilled on a macro scale in, in the book of Revelation. Amen? I wasn't planning to teach in Revelation tonight, but you're, gonna, you're getting a tidbit of where we're going to go in the next couple weeks. And this is the way Radak describes the prophecies of Zechariah and Daniel. See, in, in Zechariah 1.8, it begins with, I saw in the night. I saw by night. And this is what the this is what the Redak says. The visions of Zechariah are very obscure, like those of Daniel. But the visions of the other prophets are not so. The reason is that the power of prophecy had been gradually exhausting from the days of the captivity. Therefore they did not make their words clear, and did not understand the visions as they were. He says, I saw by night i.e. the visions of the night I saw this vision in which I beheld. See, that, and that, that's, that's one interpretation. As we get into the times of the latter prophets, we, we, we see less and less clarity. Uh, my opinion is a little different. My opinion is that as we get into the more, into greater mysteries, the mysteries that are more difficult to understand, then we're getting we're getting into a time where the visions have become obscure. They become dark, more difficult to understand. And I'll give you another opinion of the Radak. Remember in Zechariah one eight, we see the man Gabriel, the arch the archangel Gabriel. He stood in the midst of the myrtle trees. That word myrtle trees also represents the Hasidim. 
It represents the righteous ones. And the name Hadassah, remember I spoke about Esther earlier, and Esther was the seventh and final prophetess in the Hebrew scriptures. Esther was known by two names. She was known by Esther, which was her Persian name, and she was also known as Hadassah. Hadassah is uh, is like a it is it's it's it's, a, it's like a myrtle it's like a myrtle tree, and because Esther was so obedient to God and she and she obeyed the commandments and instructions of Mordecai, she is described as a pleasant one, as one with a sweet scent. And I'm telling you, saints of God, when we obey God's commandments, when we obey God's instructions, when we live lives worthy of our calling, and we like and we we strive to live our lives as free as possible from sin, it's like our lives become a sweet scent to God. And it's my prayer tonight that as you receive God's word tonight, and as God's word is being imparted to each and every one of you, that you that you allow God's word to be a sweet scent to you. And and allow you, that all of us will become a sweet scent to, to, to God. That we strive to live lives worthy of our calling. We strive to live lives where our thoughts are, and our words are pure. That we we strive to live our lives w- without gossip, without guile, without thinking evil thoughts or, or having an evil eye towards others, and 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 the, these 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 are character traits that are pleasing to God. And as we as we as we we close here over the next eight minutes, I want to talk about these angels, about these horsemen, these angels. Are, are surveyors. They are sent out by God to, to, to survey the earth. They are sent out upon missions. And what they do is, after they perform their recon, uh, their, their missions, they return back to God and report what their, uh, to report their findings. And I'll, and I'll demonstrate this to you through, through Scripture. Let's look at Zechariah chapter 6, verse 1, and then also, if you can, also look at Job chapter 1. Zechariah chapter 6, verse 1, and it reads, And again I lifted up my eyes and saw, and behold, four chariots came out from between two mountains, and the mountains were mountains of bronze. The first chariot had red horses, the second black horses, the third white horses, and the fourth chariot dappled gray horses. Now we see the colors in a different order. Then I said to the angel who talked to me, What are these, my lord? And the angel answered me, These are going forth to the four winds of heaven after presenting themselves before the Lord of all the earth. See what these angels are doing, what these chariots are doing, these chariots of angels are doing, and even the chariots themselves are angelic beings. These angels have have gone out on missions to, to survey what's taking place in the earth. And after they're done, they present themselves to the Lord. And they present their findings to the Lord. Now let's look at Job chapter 1, starting at verse 6. This will be the final scripture we'll use tonight. Job chapter 1, starting at verse 6. And it reads, Now now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. Now before we go into verse 7, we need to know who Satan is. We know Satan is the devil, we also need to know that Satan, before he fell from heaven, before he sinned, he was a cherub. He was one of the four, one of the four cherubim. And so, so, so he, he, he's an angelic being. And then it says, the Lord said, so the day came when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. The sons of God are angels. These angels have have gone and surveyed the earth. Now they return to God to report their findings, and Satan was among these angels as well. Then the Lord said to Satan, "Whence have you come?" Satan answered the Lord, "From going to and fro on the earth, and from walking up and down on it." And the Lord said to Satan, "Have you considered my servant Job?" See what we see here? The angels, including Satan um, um, among this group, ha- are reporting to God their findings because angels are sent on assignment to, to, to survey the earth and report their findings back to God. 
So that's one thing I want you to know about these horsemen and these horses. They, they're sent forth in the earth to, to survey the earth and report their findings back to God. And we see horses in other scriptures as well. Second Kings chapter 2, verses 1, verses 11 and 12. This is the, the event where Elijah was going to be taken to heaven. And in verse 1 it says, Now when the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven by a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way to Gilgal. And verse 11, And as they still went on and talked, behold, a chariot, a chariot of fire and horses of fire separated the, the two of them. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. So we see angelic activity of horses and horsemen and chariots also active in Second Kings. And when Christ Jesus the Messiah comes, we're going to see chariots of horses. We're going to see angelic activity. When we look at Ezekiel chapter 1 and Ezekiel describes the cherubim uh, and, he, and he describes the wheels and he describes uh, uh, the, the God's heavenly chariot and God's heavenly throne. These are all angelic beings. See, on earth when we describe chariots, especially in the times of the Romans, we, we, we see physical chariots and we see physical horses. We see physical wheels upon the chariots and we see, and, and, and we, and we, we, we see men so, who are the soldiers that, that are riding on those chariots. But when we see heavenly visions, the chariots are not physical chariots. These chariots are, phys are spiritual beings. For example, the, the, the Afanim, which is the Hebrew word for the wheels that are around God's heavenly chariot in Ezekiel chapter 1, these Afanim are, 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 are angelic beings that are called Afanim, which, which are wheels that represents the cycles of God. Because everything that we see in, in heaven are, are spiritual depictions. They're not physical. But we 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 as humans need phys we need phys we need physical things to be able to understand spiritual concepts, and that's another reason why Daniel and Revelation are such difficult texts to understand because we're trying to understand and interpret spiritual things using words that describe physical objects. And we're going to go ahead and close here and we'll continue on in our teaching of the end of days next Monday night. And as I close your Heavenly Father, I just pray, Lord God, that you will impart such prophetic revelation to your people. That, Lord, you will cause your people to grow leaps and bounds in you, Lord God. And, Lord, I lift up everyone that's watching online tonight, Father God, that you will bless everyone with, with prophetic dreams and prophetic visions, Lord God. Lord, I lift up my little nephew, J.D., Father God, that you will just open his eyes to the realm of the Spirit, Father God, that even as a, as a, as a seven-year-old child, Lord God, that you will cause them to become so prophetic, Lord God, and understanding the signs of the end. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen.